Good day and welcome to Big Bad Tech. I'm instructor Jim Pytel, and today we'll examine the various methods employed by a generic motor drive to decelerate a spinning motor and applied load. Our objective is to examine how motor drives coordinate coasting or free spin to stop. Springs had electrically released friction brakes, DC injection braking, and two types of dynamic braking, regenerative braking and dynamic braking making use of braking resistors to decelerate a spinning motor and applied load. This lecture is predicated to the assumption that viewers watch the ramping events for Motor Drive's lecture available at the Big Bad Tech channel. If you haven't watched this lecture yet or only dimly recall its contents, please take the time to do so now. Of the available methods, perhaps the simplest means a Motor Drive can utilize to de-energize a running motor is to immediately cease conduction without employing a deceleration period. This would be quasi-equivalent to the opening of an electromechanical contactor breaking connection to the power source. When de-energized, the motor drive executes a timed acceleration ramp up of applied voltage and excitation frequency. During constant speed mode, applied voltage and excitation frequency remain fixed. When de-energized, the motor drive immediately ceases conduction. The rotating magnetic field produced by the stator immediately collapses and the rotor and applied load coast or free spin to a stop. While suitable for some applications, free spinning to a stop is imprecise and can take a measurable time period for the rotor to come to rest if it has established a degree of rotational inertia. Additionally, a de-energized motor cannot lock the rotor in place for the purposes of holding a load. For this reason, motor drives make use of alternative deceleration braking methods, some of which you may already be familiar with given previous lectures at the Big Bad Tech channel have already discussed their electromechanical equivalents, examples being friction brakes, plugging to stop, and DC injection braking. Additionally, Motor drives, being sophisticated solid-state power electronics devices, are capable of executing dynamic braking events. Before examining these other methods, certain distinctions should be made between contact and non-contact deceleration braking methods. A friction brake is a contact method, and that is electromechanical in nature, in that it is composed of moving parts that have a very real possibility of braking or wearing out. An example being the sacrificial high friction pad making physical contact. These are consumable items, and part of regular maintenance procedures might be the inspection or replacement of the brake pads. This being said, by virtue of making physical contact and holding onto the rotor, a friction brake can actively lock a rotor in position. This allows a de-energized motor to hold a suspended object or lock something in place. Non-contact methods like DC injection braking and dynamic braking, while capable of decelerating an actively moving rotor, aren't particularly well suited for holding a de-energized motor in place. The minor exception being DC injection braking, which provides extremely limited holding capability. Non-contact methods don't have moving parts to wear out. However, they're limited only to decelerating a moving motor and not locking it in place. Motor drives can also make use of a combination of these methods taking advantage of the various characteristics. For example, decelerating a rotor using a timed ramp down of applied voltage and excitation frequency, then, following the timed deceleration event, locking the rotor in place with an application of a friction brake. The initial non-contact deceleration saves excessive wear on the consumable brake pads. However, the subsequent application of the friction brake locks the rotor in place. Let's examine each of these other deceleration methods separately, starting with friction brakes. Motor drives often include accessory electromechanical relay outputs capable of executing various functions. These accessory outputs can be used as an interface with other electrical loads or other systems necessitating different levels of control voltage. Consider a motor drive that needs to execute a controlled acceleration and deceleration in which applied voltage and excitation frequency is ramped over a user customizable time for the purposes of a soft start and soft stop. However, the brake solenoid necessitates full line-to-line -line voltage to energize the brake solenoid to completely disengage the friction brake. The multifunction electromechanical relay output solves this voltage mismatch by simply switching the full line-to-line -line voltage when signaled to do so by the motor drive. Let's assume the electromechanical relay output is configured to execute the run function, characterized by a change of states whenever the motor drive is actively accelerating, running, or decelerating the motor. When in the standby state, the normally open side of the electromechanical relay keeps the brake solenoid de-energized. Therefore, the spring-applied electrically released friction brake is engaged and the rotor is locked in place. When the acceleration period begins, applied voltage and excitation frequency ramp up. At the same time, the electromechanical relay changes states and energizes the brake solenoid with full line-to-line -line voltage, thereby disengaging the brakes 
and keeping them disengaged during the entire acceleration period, constant speed run, and deceleration period. Only after the deceleration period ends does the electromechanical relay output return to its deactivated normally open state. The spring applied electrical release friction brake is re-engaged to positively lock the rotor in place. A motor drive using this method of deceleration and braking really only needs to appropriately coordinate the action of an external device using an accessory electromechanical relay. Alternatively, using the normally closed side of the multifunctional electromechanical relay output executing the alarm function, one could configure the system such that the friction brake is engaged only during an alarm or error event. An alternative non-contact means of decelerating a rotor is via DC injection braking. If you recall, the operating principle of industrial three-phase AC motors is the establishment of a rotating magnetic field on the stator. The rotor is then compelled to follow this rotating magnetic field. DC injection braking is a method of decelerating a moving motor by halting the rotation magnetic field and applying fixed DC to the motor stator windings. When fixed DC is applied to these windings, the rotor quits chasing a rotating magnetic field and tries to align itself with a fixed magnetic field produced by the stator. This counter torque decelerates the rotor in applied load. Given the rotor has established some rotational inertia at the time of DC injection, this may take a couple of revolutions to decelerate. Each revolution becomes increasingly less rapid until the fixed poles align. The advantage of DC injection braking is that it uses non-contact electromagnetic interaction to decelerate the moving rotor and not physical contact means like a consumable friction brake that requires servicing. This being said, DC injection braking is a means of decelerating a moving rotor and not positively locking it in place. DC injection braking can provide a limited amount of holding power, however it's imprecise and not regularly employed. Here's a de-energized motor. Notice how the shaft moves quite easily. Here's a motor undergoing active DC injection braking. Notice it takes me a bit of effort to rotate the shaft while it is actively being braked. A motor drive making use of DC injection braking ordinarily coordinates this event using several different parameters. Notably, the DC injection braking power typically expresses a percentage of available braking power and the length of time the DC braking event occurs. Additionally, motor drives may also allow a DC injection braking event to be preceded by a brief free spin to stop or deceleration ramp down characterized by a delay before the actual DC injection braking event begins. Properly configured with an appropriate power rating, time length, and if a free spin or deceleration delay is to be included, a DC injection braking event can decelerate a spinning motor without the necessity of making physical contact. Here's an example. Bam! On the money! Moving on. Motor drives can also make use of a wholly different class of non-contact braking method, collectively known as dynamic braking, of which there are two main types. Regenerative dynamic braking and dynamic braking using braking resistors. We'll learn to differentiate the two methods in a moment after we've discussed dynamic braking as a whole. A certain amount of baggage comes associated with dynamic braking, namely asynchronous generation. You'll recall from way back in the mechanical power, torque, and rotational speed lecture available at the Big Bad Tech channel, that the rotor of a squirrel cage induction motor must necessarily lag the rotating magnetic field produced by the stator for the induction process to work at all. The graph of torque and rotational speed shows that the motor exerts positive torque for rotational speeds below the synchronous speed. In this operational region, the motor consumes electrical power and converts it into rotating mechanical power. If however some outside external force, let's say expanding steam, falling water, moving wind, or in our case a motor with an applied load carrying a degree of rotational inertia was capable of turning the rotor faster than the synchronous speed established by the stator, we've effectively turned this motor into a generator. A more comprehensive graph of torque and rotational speed for both aspects of a single electrical machine shows that any rotational speed in excess of the synchronous speed results in a negative or counter torque being exerted to slow the rotor. A generator is essentially consuming rotational mechanical power and converting it into exportable electrical power. Recall in the ramping events for motor drives lecture, available at the Big Bad Tech channel, then a motor drive can execute a time deceleration ramp down of applied voltage and excitation frequency. This ramp down of excitation frequency essentially shifts synchronous speed as the ramp down progresses, such that the torque speed curve changes shape during the deceleration event. 
If the motor and applied load happen to be rotating at the rated speed prior to the start of the ramp deceleration event, the reduction in excitation frequency drops synchronous speed and places this same point on the generator side of the torque speed curve. The counter torque of the generator action therefore opposes the rotational inertia of the spinning load and exports electrical energy. As the ramp down of excitation frequency progresses, the speed torque curve continues to change such that it continually decelerates the applied load. When you get right down to it, the excitation frequency ramp down process isn't just some passive event, but rather an active deceleration event known as dynamic braking, which temporarily turns the motor into a generator. As the motor drive decreases excitation frequency, it slows the synchronous speed produced by the stator such that the counter torque or braking action actively slows the rotor. The two different methods of dynamic braking methods convey the intended destination of the electrical energy produced by the generator action. Regenerative dynamic braking converts the mechanical energy of braking into exportable electrical energy, which is stored in the DC link, or sometimes even fed straight back to the grid. This implies that the whole drive might be bidirectional in nature and have sufficient capacity to absorb, package, and dissipate the result in electrical energy. This means regenerative braking is therefore limited to the capacity and ability of the motor drive and may not be applicable or even permissible in certain applications. A load with excessively large rotational inertia with too quick of a deceleration period can easily cause the backfat electrical energy to rise to dangerous levels. For this reason, a longer deceleration period might be necessary, or perhaps a less restrictive destination for the backfat electrical energy can be employed. Dynamic braking using braking resistors solve these limitation issues by dumping the exported electrical energy not into the finicky grid or limited capacity DC link, but rather into a far less exclusive high power braking resistor that dissipates it in the form of heat. Braking resistors must be sized for the occasion and can get astoundingly hot during frequent use. Ask me how I know. For this reason, they're often mounted on the sides or the back of an electrical cabinet to ensure ample heat distribution surfaces. Before we bring this lecture to a close, let's take a quick look at both the mechanical and electrical aspects of a dynamic braking application. Consider a motor driving some massive load, in this case a heavy flywheel. When the motor drive does not reduce excitation frequency over a measurable time period, but rather immediately halts conduction, this flywheel free spins to a stop. However, takes an appreciable amount of time for this load to come to rest. Five minutes and 48 seconds to be exact. No, we are not gonna wait this long. Trust me, it takes just shy of six minutes to come to rest. Now let's see what happens when we try to decelerate this load using regenerative braking with a timed linear ramp down of applied voltage and excitation frequency. In this case, the regenerative nature of the braking event is limited to storing the backfed electrical energy into the DC link and does not export it to the grid. When an operator initiates the deceleration ramp down, the excitation frequency drops and a counter torque exerted by the generator action decelerates the heavy flywheel enough that I can stop it with a touch of my finger in only 13 seconds. Free spinning to the stop is glaringly different than the active and forceful deceleration enabled by regenerative braking. All the mechanical power of the spinning flywheel has been dissipated by storing it in the DC link. Note the value of the DC link as indicated by this motor drive, spikes during the regenerative braking event. If the motor drive lacked capacity and throughput to regeneratively brake this load, alternatively, the backfed electrical energy could be dumped to a dynamic braking resistor. As an illustration of the electrical interchange occurring between the motor drive and the motor during dynamic regenerative braking, let's take a look at this quick video clip. This next section necessitates the viewer have some understanding of AC circuit analysis, and if not, just go with it. Here's the voltage and line current drawn by the motor drive from the source on top and the voltage and line current provided to the motor on the bottom while it rests. You'll note the motor drive at rest is just casually sipping current in an acyclic manner simply to power the onboard electronics. Note the fixed frequency voltage source input is in yellow and the current is in blue. The bottom set of traces show the motor drive is obviously supplying no current to the motor at rest. Voltage is in purple and current is in red. When an operator initiates the ramp up event, note the motor drive starts taking increasingly bigger gulps of current from the source. The output of the motor drive ramps up applied voltage and increases excitation frequency.
When the deceleration event begins, note as the motor drive decreases applied voltage and excitation frequency, it temporarily ceases to draw any current from the source. Where is the current coming from? I'll tell you where it's coming from. This is the regenerative braking process in action. As the motor drive ramps down excitation frequency, the spinning load with rotational inertia turns this motor into a generator and returns power to the motor drive, which stores it in the DC link. When the deceleration event ceases, conduction halts, and the motor drive returns to an idle status. Here's the same clip again without all the chitter chatter. Even if you cannot comprehend or appreciate the dynamic braking event on every level that I do, please, at a minimum, be sufficiently aware enough to recognize that the input of the motor drive experiences the fixed excitation frequency of the supply network, whereas the output of the motor drive varies both applied voltage and excitation frequency as required by the needs of the acceleration, constant speed, and deceleration phases. Note during the acceleration event, the wave length starts long and tightens up as excitation frequency increases. During constant speed mode, frequency remains fixed at around 60 Hz. You can obviously recognize the electrically noisy output voltage characteristic of a pulse width modulated inverter. During the deceleration event, wavelength increases as excitation frequency drops. and then halts altogether. All right, one last item before we say goodbye. Since we ran through a couple different incantations of deceleration methods, let's compare and contrast these methods with one another. It should be well within your capacity to understand that free spinning to a stop is a total abdication of any attempt, even the most minimal, at bringing a rotating load to rest. Free spinning to a stop therefore takes the longest time to decelerate a de-energized motor. Additionally, free spinning to a stop cannot positively lock a de-energized motor in place. This being said, it's stupidly simple, requires absolutely no hardware, and only necessitates the motor drive immediately cease conduction. What happens after that is left for the fates to decide. On the other end of the response spectrum is a spring-applied electrically released friction brake. This is an extremely rapid means of decelerating a de-energized motor and positively locking it in place. However, it necessitates external, physical hardware that has a real possibility of breaking or wearing out over time. The remaining methods, DC injection braking, and the various methods of dynamic braking fit inside this range as follows. DC injection braking, depending upon configuration, has a tendency to hug the friction brake end of the spectrum in that it exhibits a more rapid deceleration and provides at least limited holding power. The notable difference between DC injection braking and friction brakes is that DC injection braking is a non-contact method of deceleration that may or may not be an integrated feature in a particular motor drive. Dynamic braking, depending on configuration, has a slightly less rapid deceleration rate, however provides no holding power. Like DC injection braking, dynamic braking is a non-contact method of deceleration and may or may not be an integrated feature in a particular motor drive. Hardware requirements for regenerative braking are minimal if the feature is already integrated, However, some manufacturers necessitate expensive add-on components. Dynamic braking using a braking resistor might necessitate an external accessory high-power dynamic braking resistor. It should be noted that accessory components and configuration parameters may alter the behavior and response time of the various deceleration events. For example, dynamic braking could use a linear, an S-shaped, or even a two-step profile of frequency as a function of time for the deceleration event depending on the needs of the application. Additionally, a staged combination of two or more methods can be employed, maximizing the benefits of the various approaches. Finally, finally, it should be noted that a motor drive needn't always decelerate or break a load. There exist times when a motor drive must bring a load to a quick stop, and other times when coasting will suffice. Consider the act of jogging or inching, the brief excitation of a motor for the purpose of partial rotation, aligning a shaft, or some other minute movement. The precision of a jogging action is greatly increased if the jogging action is immediately followed by a rapid and purposeful deceleration event. Jogging events for motor drives are therefore often accompanied by one or more of the above deceleration methods, which, depending upon the application, may or may not be the case for the constant speed mode. We'll examine motor drive jogging events and more in later lectures.
In conclusion, this lecture took a brief look at deceleration methods employed by motor drives. We examined coasting or free spin to a stop, spring applied electrical release friction brakes, DC injection braking, and two types of dynamic braking, regenerative braking and dynamic braking making use of braking resistors. Additionally, we compared and contrasted these methods and discussed scenarios befitting a combination or variation of the above deceleration techniques. Remember to review these concepts as often as you need to really drive at home. Imagine how well lab will go if you know what you're doing. Thank you very much for your attention and interest, and we'll see you again during the next lecture of our series. Remember to tell your lazy lab partner about this resource, and be sure to check out the Big Bad Tech channel for additional resources and updates. Thank <laughs> you.